Hello, everyone. My name is Maya Sadani, and I'm the Managing Director and Legal and Judicial Director of the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy, or TIMEP. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to today's event, 10 Years On, Organizing in Tunisia, Egypt, and Syria. Today's event, which takes place on the anniversary of Egypt's Day of Rage, as Tunis undergoes renewed protests even as we speak, and as Syrians continue to find ways to push for accountability as the world looks away, is being hosted as part of a larger project that Time Up launched in December that seeks to platform those who have organized, are organizing, and will organize in the MENA region on the ground, online, and in exile. Not only in the countries that underwent protests one decade ago, but in, the, in those that have witnessed more recent movements as well. Without further ado, I'm eager to introduce and hand it off to my friend and our wonderful moderator, Shireen Tadros. Shireen is currently Amnesty International's representative to the UN and the deputy director of advocacy. She was formerly a foreign correspondent for Al Jazeera English and Sky News based in the Middle East, and she covered the Arab uprisings for Al Jazeera. Hey, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the Tahrir Institute for putting this event together and, and also for using the 10 year anniversary, not only to stock take and look back, but maybe more importantly, as an opportunity to inspire new generations to keep the fight going. And that's really the point of the next hour and a half, because I am under strict instructions by everyone not to sit and reminisce about the Arab uprisings and what could have been. Honestly, I doubt any of us have the emotional capacity to do that. Um, as one of our panelists wrote in a recent essay, there is something exhausting about how the Arab Spring is being remembered. I cannot agree more. So rather, what we really want to do here is talk about two things. One, how has organizing and mass mobilization changed in the last 10 years? And secondly, the challenges and opportunities of this difficult moment in terms of speaking out and actually doing activism. For the second half of our time, I'll be taking your questions for the panelists. We'll be accepting questions throughout the event through the question feature. The event is being recorded, so we'll make sure to provide the YouTube link when we're done. And if you'd like to live tweet, please use the hashtag 10 years on. OK, we are very lucky to be joined by three extraordinary people, human rights defenders, writers, thinkers, ultimately brave souls who can really speak to creating movements for change in an environment where you feel the space for, sp for free speech closing in on you. Joining us from Cairo, Lina Atala is currently the co-founder and chief editor of Medamast, one of the last remaining independent online Egyptian newspapers. Her long career in journalism spans from the BBC World Service Trust to the managing editor of Egypt Independent newspaper. And last year, she was recognized by Time magazine in their top 100 most influential people list. From Istanbul, Noura Ghezi is a human rights lawyer and founded Families for Freedom, one of the first women-led movements in Syria. The group campaigned for the return of Syria's disappeared. Noura also founded the Free Vessel campaign and is the executive director of No Photo Zone, an NGO dedicated to promoting awareness of cases of detention in Syria. And lastly, from Tunis, Ayman Zahboudi is a professor of public law at the Institute of Press and Information Sciences in Tunis. He's also the legal advisor of Article 19 MENA, an NGO that defends freedom of expression in the region. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to everyone um, listening and watching. We have almost 100 people online already in the first few minutes. Um, I'm going to launch straight in with my first question to Lina. Um, because you wrote somewhere, Lina, that on the first day of the uprising um, 10 years ago, 25th of January 2011, um, that you went to a protest and you got, there was a stampede, you fell down and your glasses broke. But that was this sort of crazy moment, almost like the universe was telling you to look at these protests um, with a new perspective, with a new, with a new vision. So I'm wondering, when you look at what's going on in Egypt today in terms of the crackdown on journalism, civil society, free speech, what perspective do you think we should have? Um, well, thank you, Shireen. And uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here and uh, <laughs> uh, on the occasion of uh, this anniversary. 
um, I, 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 I always like to remember January 25th as, um, as, as a day, 25th in particular, um, and as opposed to even 28th, because it's, um, it's that day when I felt that uh, we needed to look at the world in a completely different way. And even though, you know, I'm one of those people who don't like to uh, perceive the revolution in nostalgic and and you know closed up um sort of narratives of of defeat and failure and 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 so on um i have this clarity that what happened in january 25 the 25th and the days that followed is such um um, put us in such a privileged position of condensed learning of um how to do politics differently, how to think of organizing differently, and so on. Not that these things did not exist before, because as we all know, and as we all like to advocate, these revolutions didn't come out of nowhere. Of course, it was an eruption, it was a surprise and everything, but of course, there have also been before them, specifically in the decade before, and it's the decade that concerned my generations for the most part, there has been a lot of thinking about organizing and organizing differently and the different paths and avenues of organizing that are that are possible. The difference about the revolution is that there is this condensation of the experience. You, you got to think about so many things um, because of this huge possibility that was there. And I feel that this condensed moment continues to stay with us on very important questions such as the very question of organizing that is uh the the you know the the main topic or question that this panel is interested in um if we you know think of the present right now and and all the all the impossibilities that we are surrounded with all the repression that we have to to operate under um it is still possible to think of how this this condensed moment that is the revolution has given us this um, this energy to constantly reckon with uh, what does it take to work in difficult conditions in difficult circumstances. So I feel, for example, the classical question of do we organize under party politics versus in alternative uh, forms of policy. Poli political uh, practice is still very present, for example, is something that we think about and we talk about. And there is this one party, at least, that's there that's trying, despite, again, the, the all the repression and despite the tight margin, all of that, that is trying to still advocate the importance of party politics in the classical way. At the same time, um, the you know human rights groups, the ones that are there, the ones that have made the choice, the clear choice of continuing to do work now, is reckoning with the fact that human rights is a very um, is a is 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 a very is a cornerstone of contentious politics in a moment like this, and how can we keep it relevant uh, in times of crisis like this? As far as I'm concerned, as as the newspaper, um, um, as far as the newspaper that I co-founded is concerned, I look at it as an org an experience in organizing. And I've always said from the beginning that um, um, Madame Osu, which is the newspaper I, I, I co-founded, is not just an endeavor in publishing, in in putting content out there. It's also an endeavor in institutional building and working together. How what does it take? for a group of people, a group of journalists who share some uh, uh, progressive values, who have been in different ways part of this revolution, how they can, how can they come together um, and work in a productive way, and, and how their, the very practices of the institution can reflect the very progressive content that we are trying to put out there. So I consider these all types of organizing on professional levels that are still there. The last two things I'll say is that, um, Crisis is obviously, um, we live in a moment of crisis, which is obviously very different than the opening um, that the revolution has uh, has, has, has offered us. Um, it also feels very stagnant. It feels like it's a crisis that's here to stay, unlike this also very rupturous-like movement that was there during the revolution. But crisis is always pregnant with possibilities. This is not to fetishize or romanticize crisis or anything like this, but just to say that, um, you know, I considered that if there wasn't a crisis, there wouldn't have been Madame Osso. And if there wasn't Madame Osso, you know, there wouldn't be still a few independent voices out there trying to do that kind of work 
in Egypt. So as much as you know, revolution is uh, a possibility, crisis is a, a possibility um, as well. And, um, and the second thing I, I would want to say is that because we op we've been traditionally operating within a certain margin, pre-revolution, I would have to say it was a bit of a more expansive margin, but we've become pros at um, at working within margins in some in some ways. Of course, it's very taxing when the margin is tighter and tighter and tighter. But at the same time, um, you know, it's it 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 became a craft for us. You know, we've never had this open field where we can do everything we want to do, except from the few days of the revolution and maybe the few months that followed. But after that, we're back to a practice that we've become pro at in 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 certain ways. So it's also a question of uh, resorting to these tactics and, um, and, and, and this craft of, of working within a margin. So yeah, I'd, I'd stop there and we carry on. Yeah, no, and I think it's a really important point about not romanticizing um, the times that came before it as if suddenly it was, you know, um, you know, there was a period in Egypt where everything was open and, and, and free. But, you know, narratives change, narrative of events change over time. And I think this year, January 25th in Egypt was referred to by state media once again as police day, right? And um, a friend of, of ours, a human rights defender and journalist, Hassan Bahget, described recently what he called a growing war on narrative and on memory. So remind us about what that moment 10 years ago really was about and the importance of not buying into these revisionist versions of what happened. Um, you know, for me, it was a shape-shifting event, right? Uh, and, you know, regardless of how it's called, and, you know, this, despite these classical narrative wars, and they are not new to anyone's, you know, anyone will call an event um, in alignment with <laughs> their political views. What wouldn't, would never change is what this event did for us on intellectual, political, and spiritual levels. And for me, it was a shape-shifting event. It was an event where we could rethink altogether how we think about politics, how do we think about power, how do we need to organize, how we can work together, and, you know, and, and what do we want to do with politics if we have the possibility to do something with politics. So for me, there is nothing that will change that, you know, and even though Nothing much was built um, in terms of, you know, in terms of actual classical institutional gains. Uh, nobody amongst our ranks has taken power or anything like that. But at the same time, I feel that what's staying with us um, deep down and in different ways is this immense belief that, um, that, you know, there is a certain possibility lying out there. It just also takes, um, this, this shape-shifting exercise of thinking differently about politics and so on. For me, this is this 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 was it. And you know, not to you know stay in the abstract. You know, it's for me my narrative is very clear. It was um, it was a formidable moment of you know coalescing of politics, uh, political uh, political demands and um, socio-economic demands. You know, it was that moment when there was this collapse. Um, of, of different kinds of demands, basically summarizing the failure um, of, um, of this authority that was ruling us for decades, um, and basically, you know, um, it, you know, clarifying how, you know, these people who are out there protesting and risking their lives are not just out there for bread alone or for freedom alone or for any of these things alone, everything together. It, it was fascinating how from day one, from the first hours of January 25th, the chant was for dignity. It was against police brutality, which was, you know, what, what you know, started the whole thing. And it was, you know, for bread. And it was for, you know, our basically right to live free and in good conditions in our, in our countries, which is our basic right, which we continue to demand in different ways, not necessarily through revolutions at this point. So it is that for me, it has always been that for me. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Eamon, I see you nodding a lot to what Lena is saying in terms of what the re revolution in Egypt meant at, at the, in that moment. Um, so I'm wad wondering from, from your perspective, Tunisia has been seen as this sort of success story. 
um, of the Arab Spring countries or the Arab uprising countries. Um, from your perspective, do you think that um, that kind of story or narrative of Tunisia's uh, revolution has helped or hindered the progress towards democracy? Uh, thank you, Shireen, uh, for your question. And I agree totally with, uh, with all the thoughts of uh, Lina. Uh, first of all, I would like to start by thanking uh, the Tahrir Institute for uh, the initiative to organize this webinar, which is extremely timely with all of the protests ongoing now in Tunisia. And uh, also I want to share with you all my thoughts to a brave, smart warrior and a beautiful girl who participated and contributed at the Tunisian revolution. Her name is uh, Lina Benmeni. She passed away exactly one year ago. And uh, coming back to your question, Shirin, I would like to stress on the particularity of the Tunisian context compared to uh, to other country in the region. First of all, immediately after 14 January 2011, uh, the Tunisian uh, government adopted several regulations or laws which are very progressive and contributed largely to protect organizing and mass mobilization. I mean here laws on associations, political party, press, media, and access to information. These laws allowed individuals and group to organize joint actions and keeping the civic space in Tunisia open largely. Another characteristic of Tunisian context is the very strong national organizations such as the Workers uh, Association or the, worker, the Workers Union, the League of Human Rights and the Journalist Associations and other key actors with a high capacity to mobilize groups and individuals to defend human rights and the democratic process in, uh, in Tunisia. I would not also uh, uh, forget uh, the role of online platforms in facilitating the communication uh, to organize events and uh, to influence public opinion regarding issues has raised, has raised during the previous 10 years. And if I go back to uh, these 10 years, I would split it into uh, four periods. The first one is 2011. The second one is bet between 2012 to 2014. The third period is from 2015 to 2019. And the fourth one is since uh, the last presidential and legislative election in October 2019. Coming to the first period, uh, 2011 was a year where the mobilization of the civil society was focused mainly on writing a new constitution by an elected constitute assembly. And uh, the success of this year was measured by the success of organizing the first ever free and pluralistic elections in Tunisia. Then, uh, in the second period uh, from 2012 till 2014, uh, where the mobilization was focused mainly to protect the Tunisian model of society marked by the protection of women's rights and individual freedoms. These rights and freedoms were threatened by the Islamist and Salafist mo movement at that time. The situation of women's rights uh, was uh, badly affected by the Islamist and Salafist political party and even uh, the discussion inside the Constituent Assembly regarding women's rights were, mar were marked by very conservative uh, view. Also, uh, several political uh, and civil rights have been partially enshrined in the Constitution, in the draft of the Constitution, and uh, also the clause of limitation uh, rights didn't respect the international standard regarding the limitation of human rights, as we found several expression issued from religion and moral vocabulary which could be used later to limit in a legal way rights and freedoms. The situation was worsened after the two assassination of politician Shukri Blaid and Mohammed Brahmi in 2012 and 2013. And those, those, these two years are very important in, in, in this period of 10 years. Two huge mobilizations took part in 2012 and 2013 and have contributed to change. In 2012, 
large protest to include more protection to women's rights in the constitution. And at the end, the Tunisian civil society succeeded to, uh, to bring more guarantee uh, into the Tunisian constitution. Also in 2013, in July, after the assassination of uh, MPs Mohamed Ibrahimi, uh, also huge protest uh, with one uh, revendication, it's to settle a clear roadmap with a clear outcome. Then the third period, we start from 2015 till 2019. And during this time, organizing and mobilization aimed mainly to push the government and the parliament to step backward from the adoption of problematic laws which could limit the civic space in Tunisia. I'm thinking here about, uh, for example, the draft law on the state of emergency, which contains several provisions that could be used by the government to limit the freedoms uh, in non-constitutional way, or also the law related to the protection of security forces, or also the, the draft law related to media and press law. All these actions succeeded to hinder such uh, dangerous uh, legislative initiative. The fourth period began after uh, the presidential and legislative election of September and October 2019. And uh, as you uh, may know, that uh, the elections, the last elections, brought a mosaic political uh, map where no political party succeeded to have the majority or at least close to, to it. And um, this situation pushed political parties to form coalition between, for example, left and right parties, or Islamist and liberal parties. And of course, all of these uh, uh, components of the coalition have not uh, the same uh, political uh, program, uh, either on freedom uh, issues, or uh, economy issues, or social uh, issues. And beside this political factor, the outbreak of the pandemic has influenced the situation in Tunisia, and the people went out to protest for political, social, and economic rights. Just two weeks ago, uh, uh, it started in Tunisia, a huge uh, demonstration uh, through all the countries, and the main reivindication uh, of, the, of the young people, it's uh, social and economic uh, rights, and of course, always freedoms and human rights are one of those um, uh, reivindication. And uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, and this is story, it's success story of the Tunisian civil society, and I'm always uh, stressing on, uh, on sharing it with, uh, with others. So at the beginning of the pandemic, the civil society uh, was able to, to organize a joint action, joint action uh, to tackle a draft law proposed from uh, some MPs in the parliament. And uh, these MPs wanted to adopt a new legislation to criminalize uh, with four years of prison any person who publish content that contain defamation or fake news. And uh, through internet, I mean through Facebook and through other social media, the civil society uh, uh, could uh, coordinate in a rapid way to publish a joint statement and to contact radio and television to explain the harmful impact of such law uh, on freedom of uh, expression. And at the end, this uh, uh, draft law was withdrawn uh, from the parliament. At the end, I would say that it's true that the Tunisian people uh, could push out the president, the ex-president Zin Abidin Ben Ali from the country and from the regime. But the regime itself is still ruling as the same, uh, 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 I mean, uh, this, we, we can find the same instruments used to be used uh, before the revolution are even now still valid and are uh, used by the, by the government and by all of the civil uh, servants. For example, uh, the behavior of the security forces doesn't cha didn't change. Uh, also, we have problem with the independence of the justice. A corrupted politician, even now, uh, one month ago, the minister of uh, environment was uh, uh, arrested and now he's in jail because of uh, a corruption uh, affair. Also, high civil servants are involved in such uh, scandal. Uh, maybe the difference is that we have more now space to express ourselves and to organize and to reach public opinion inside and outside uh, Tunisia, and we should keep fighting uh, to protect the democratic uh, transition in, in the country. 
And so you mentioned that there is a little bit of that space, right, that exists right now, especially if you compare it to other countries that experienced uprisings in 2011. What what can you do with that space practically in order to dismantle some of the you know remnants of the regime that you described, some of those instruments of repression? First of all, it's uh, uh, we reclaim more. Uh, I mean, the civic space could be a very essential tool uh, to raise awareness among young people, and uh, uh, raising awareness, also uh, talking about this affair. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, ex exercising control over uh, the public bodies. I mean, it's important now that we still have uh, like uh, 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 some light where we can uh, use through freedom of expression, freedom of media, freedom of uh, demonstration. We can use all of these freedoms to fight for other freedoms. And it's very important to use the political and civil freedoms to fight for also social and economical freedoms. And uh, this it's uh, very important to, share, uh, to, to raise it in Tunisia and to spread it not only in Tunisia, even in the region, that uh, social and economic rights I cannot go alone. They can go only with, at the same time, political and civil uh, rights. Thank you so much for that, amen. And and now to Noura, you, because you you certainly are someone who knows how to fight those instruments of, of um, oppression and, and something you've been doing for so many years now. You personally experienced the pain of separation as a result of forced disappearance and of course the killing of, of your husband. You chose to set up organizations and campaigns dedicated to raising awareness and, and lobbying for detainees. So tell us how you went about doing that and what gap you were trying to fill in setting up organizations like No Photo Zone and Families for Freedom. Hello, Shireen. Thank you and thank you, Fair Tahrir Institute, for having us. And it's an honor to be with Ayman and Lina. Um, actually, I I'm like uh, a woman, like uh, maybe most of the women in the Arab country and MENA region. So I was growing up under the dictatorship, actually. So it's what I'm doing now, it's a kind of continuation to what I started maybe uh, early at my uh, adulthood. Um, like I decided to be a human rights lawyer when I was just 13. It was because my father was a former political prisoner because he was a leader for an oppositional party and he was detained for almost nine times. So um, when I got um, like to go to the university, actually I, I wanted to be an actress, but I remember that promise for my father and the officers in the uh, Supreme Security uh, State uh, Court that I will become a human rights lawyer and defend all the political prisoners and prisoner of conscience. Mm -hmm. uh, like yesterday I remarked the 17 years uh, uh, for me as a human rights lawyer. And I was just remembering what I've been through all this all these years because be, before the revolution in Syria that started in March uh, 2011, I was defending uh, uh, political prisoners and prisoners of conscience before the uh, Supreme Security State, State Court. And um, I started my human rights um, work and advocacy and defending when I was just 19, actually. And uh, it's like a very romantic and sad story that um, when when the revolution in Tunisia started and then in Egypt, we were inspired by everything. We felt that we are in, in some way, we are united uh, like over all this geographical region. And we started to plan to our own revolution to asking for basically for freedom and particularly for freedom for detainees in, in Syria, because like arbitrary detention and enforced disappearance in Syria have been practiced like for, let's say, since like early of 60s. So it's not uh, that new issues. So when the revolution started and we were de demonstrated in the streets uh, and it was like non-violent and peaceful demonstration 
first I met my husband through during one of these demonstrations in Eastern Ghouta. We felt in love, we got engaged, and we decided to make our wedding party on the first anniversary of our uh, first meeting. But uh, unfortunately, he was detained just two weeks before our wedding party. What I was doing during this uh, like period before he was detained, that I was defending political prisoners and prisoners of conscience, like almost it was almost one two hundred uh, detainees every day in in Syria d during the first days of the revolution, the first months actually. So the Syrian uh, the Syrian regime almost detained and uh, disappeared every uh, peaceful activist in Syria and one of the very famous and high profile uh, most of the high profile activists actually they are killed or still disappeared or out of the country. So after ten months of my husband's disappearance, uh, he was uh, referred to the central prison in Damascus which I could visit him and we got married in prison. So we got the name of the bride and the groom of the Syrian revolution and that was the, like the best name that I ever got. I unfortunately, I defended like hundreds of uh, activists and prisoners, but I could not defend my, my husband uh, because he was referred to the military field court. Um, and this is one of the like basic problems in Syria, it's the exceptional court that break all the uh, international Syrian laws and basically the Syrian constitution. So I spent almost three years visiting my husband regularly, like two, three times every week and visit, visiting all the uh, pris prisoners. And uh, I, I was so lucky that I could visiting, uh, visit my husband without any bars actually, but uh, I, I now I remember that uh, he mentioned many times that he he's, he was proud that I'm a human rights lawyer, but sometimes he feels sad because uh, because I'm a lawyer, so I visit many prisoners each time, not just him. Uh, during this uh, these years, I was uh, getting the testimonies of the pri prisoners about the um, like ill treatment, torture, a summary execution, and uh, all the violation that uh, m m committed by the exceptional courts. And I was um, like delivering this information for the international uh, human rights organization and for all the like uh, representatives of the country that involved in the Syrian fight. And then I, I got a travel ban uh, between 2007 until 2014. So I got, uh, I could, I became able to travel. So it was easier for, uh, for my uh, activism uh, after traveling and um, Unfortunately, in uh, October 20, 2015, my husband uh, disappeared again from the central prison in Damascus, and it was a lot of remorse that people said that he will be released very soon. Uh, others said that he was sentenced to death. So, like a very long uh, suffering uh, I had at this uh, time uh, until almost. Um, August 2017, when I declared that my husband was executed by the military field uh, field court. Uh, early in tw during this time, actually, I was uh, thinking and I was inspired by the Lebanese experience of the uh, committee of families of kidnapped and enforced disappearance in Lebanon, and I was uh, thinking and planning for something like this in Syria, so it was like a kind of um, coincidence that there are many women uh, uh, th uh, was thinking uh, like me. So we, we gathered and we we launched a Families for Freedom movement in, uh, in Geneva. And it's like the first family association and uh, a, a, a woman-led movement that advocated for the rights of detainees and enforced disappeared, not only who are held by the Syrian regime, but who are held by all the parties in, in Syria. So now the conflict in Syria is very complicated, actually. And it like when we think that 
it's almost 10 years now and we are paying very high price and our suffering is still ongoing and the situation inside Syria is is so bad actually like on la the daily needs of, of Syrians um, it's a kind of struggle to 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 get it um, all these security circumstances and the threatened by the Syrian regime and other parties pushed me to leave Syria early in 2018. So I went to Lebanon and actually I was supposed to go to UK to get a master's. But when I, uh, I arrived in Lebanon and uh, saw that there are a lot of needs for the families of missing persons and families of detainees in, in Lebanon and I I felt that I don't want to leave, I want to stay in Lebanon and to establish no photo zone. And actually no photo zone was an old dream between Basel, my late husband and me. So I got the chance to do it in, in Lebanon and we basically, we almost cover all the areas in Lebanon. We work inside Syria and now we are working in Turkey. What I want to do in no photo zone is like to, to enable the, those families of missing persons and detainees to have the chance to express themselves and to to guarantee the eternity of their beloved ones who were uh, like kidnapped or disappeared by by many parties. What we do is like we basically we we provide legal assistance, uh, legal empowerment and advocacy, but we believe in no photo zone that the victims and the families of victims must be the representatives of the Syrian community. They they have their own needs, they have their own suffering, uh, so they have the right and they have they only have the right to, to, to say their demands and to be in every place uh, locally and internationally that discuss the Syrian issue. Thank you for that. I mean, your, your story really is an inspiration. I mean, I remember last year you were speaking to the UN Security Council and you gave this very strong and passionate statement. And something that you said really struck with me. Um, you asked the ambassadors, should we submit to injustice and tyranny in order not to be called traitors? And I think that is something that will resonate with everyone here, the panelists and beyond the panelists. Um, because we're living in an environment where activism is becoming a dirty word, where counterterrorism legislation is being used effectively to shut down any criticism of government, let alone action against the government. Um, and in an environment like that, my question to you is, how do we continue to organize and counter the government narrative without getting arrested or, or even worse? I think you're on mute, Nura. We can't okay. hear you. There you are. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So thank you for mentioning this. Uh, as uh, as you were saying, Shirin, when I was um, attending the UN Security Council, actually, and I was saying my, my speech, I was thinking of my family in Syria, because all my family is still in, in Syria. And I was thinking that I am saying this now, and I am ready to pay any like additional price for, for everything that I'm, I'm doing, but um, is it now like a kind of embarrassing for the senior representative in the UN Security Council that I am saying it literally that you accuse us as traitors and as terrorists just because we are saying no. And it's a kind of propaganda that at the first of the uh, uh, demonstration and uprising in Syria, they were like call us in many different names and uh, like uh, many different uh, description. And then um, like it was uh, evolution, evoluting uh, day by day, then they, they decided just to call us terrorists actually. And then they established the counter of terrorism court, which is a kind of like, it's a kind of a proof that they are terrorists and we are just refer them to a trial and it's all these trials is um, exceptional trials actually and exceptional courts. So it was a kind of that 
calling traitor in Syria is unfortunately is is so easy. Maybe it's not just in Syria, maybe in all the Arab countries, unfortunately, but it's like um, at the beginning, maybe like the first year of the revolution, we were accused that we are terrorists or traitor by the Syrian regime. And then we, we have all this like um, uh, armed parties and Islamist and uh, 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 radicalist parties that are in the middle of this conflict in Syria. And unfortunately, like each, each party, even the Syrian regime are um, like supported by another country and by its its agendas. Um, it's it's so like it, it's so sad now, and it's like so frustrating now when we look to the Syrian map, for example, that we we see a lot of flags, like foreign flags on the on on one country. Like we we have some uh, some regions uh, with Israel, we have some re regions with America, with uh, with the Turkey, with the uh russia with the uh, iran so it's so frustrating to see all of this and uh at least when a regime is not able to protect his country and his sovereignty so he has to go no, thank you and and i i would love to ask lena and Ayman the same question actually i would be abusing my moderator privileges if i do because we're now going to turn to the um, audience questions and there is uh, 93 people right now online so I'm sure you have a lot of questions please start writing them in the in the little question mark box that you can see um, hopefully on your screen um, and and while while you do that and while we sort of gather some of your questions um, I'd like to bring in the founder and executive director of the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy Rami Ya'u um, he previously served as chief of staff of the Free Egyptians Party in Egypt he has many different hats and many different lives and he is no stranger to any of us uh, Rami thank you again for for organizing all of this and I do have a question for you um, I feel like again I'm abusing my my privilege because I really have wanted to ask you this for a while but you're just someone who has straddled so many different worlds politics activism the NGO sector you've you, you've really tried presumably you've been searching I guess to make a real change and a difference through these different jobs and through these you know different roles in which one of those roles did you feel closest would you say to doing that to making a change and a difference uh, Shireen, thank you so much, and thank you to all the panelists. We're very honored and proud to be hosting all of you, and it's such an honor to be in your presence. Um, and thanks to the Tahrir Institute team for putting this together. I didn't do anything. The team always carries my weight, so I really appreciate that. Um, you know, it's a that's a very good question because it has been a, it's definitely been a struggle. I will say, um, uh, obviously not to market the Harry Institute, but I think through the Harry Institute, um, it's been not the easiest, but it's been the most free. Uh, and I'll give, uh, and, I'll, and I'll say that uh, with some sorrow, uh, but also some joy, the sorrow part comes from the fact that we had to do this overseas um, to be able to maintain this kind of leverage uh, and freedom to express things. Sometimes it's hard to, as Lina was mentioning earlier, working within the margins uh, domestically. Uh, and, um, you know, with Tahrir being based in Washington, D.C., there's some uh, ability to host and support local voices in the region um, uh, without these, or with expanding some of these margins a little bit, because also we still operate within these margins based on what people on the ground can say. Um, I will add one more thing. One of the most frustrating experiences that even though I know you did not ask this, but uh, was working in the, the attempt to build a political party uh, or a system in Egypt post-revolution. Uh, that was definitely the most uh, frustrating and in fact, probably the, the hardest uh, of them all. Um, uh, but but with, within that within that context, I'd say um, uh, being at being at time up is is a blessing for now, but also um, um, uh, you know it remains to be a challenge. Thank you so much for that, and um, do feel free to stick around if there's any questions that you feel oh, you want to jump sure. back in. Yes. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Okay, we are getting we are getting a lot of questions for for all of you, so let me start. Uh, we have a question for Amen to start with. 
Can you talk a little bit about Abir Musi and her significance in the current moment? From your perspective, is her popularity a temporary response to difficult conditions in Tunisia, or is there a broader and more permanent constituency among Tunisians for her anti-revolution or pro-authoritarian views? Amen. Very good and timely, timely question. Uh, I can say that Abir Musi, which which represent uh, the old ruling uh, regime, and uh, the popularity of uh, her party is increasing. All the polls during the previous months uh, showing that uh, it's uh, it's it's on the top of the of the political party and the expectation say that uh, if the elections will be organized soon, uh, she will get around about 40% of seats from uh, in the parliament. For the presidential election, our actual uh, president is still far away uh, the first in, in the polls. And uh, the explanation why uh, such uh, political party is now uh, occupying the first rank in, in the polls and why the Tunisian people are uh, looking behind this political party, I would explain it by the failure of uh, uh, the revolutionary party to realize the expectation of Tunisian people, basically the young people. And uh, some of the slogan of the Tunisian revolution, which were uh, shared also in Syria, in Yemen, Libya, Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, it's shogl, uh, it means job, freedoms, and national dignity. And uh, if we want to uh, analyze the past 10 years under the light of these three slogans, job, freedoms, and national dignity, we have the conclusion that uh, the, the ruling regime since 2011 failed in uh, realizing uh, this expectation. Jobs are uh, uh, more and more, I mean, the, the economic and uh, social situation, it's worsened more and more. Uh, freedoms also, we still, we still, we are fighting to get uh, our, uh, our freedoms and uh, the national dignity also is not, it's not very well respected. And uh, this explains a little bit why the majority of the Tunisian people now they have like a, a, a memory to go back to the uh, to the regime before 2011. But also, I have to to mention one important uh, thing that and this it has to do also with the challenges and uh, of the of the present moment for the mobilization on the ground uh, for the people for Tunisian people. There is, uh, we observed that there is a lack of engagement of youth, of Tunisian young people in a permanent basis. Uh, and this is an important challenge. And therefore, uh, we should work more on raising awareness and explaining to them that social and economic rights have no meaning without political and civil rights, as all the human rights are a unity. And raising the awareness of young, uh, of young people is essential to reinforce the legitimacy of the revolution. And some, some political regime in the region, for example, even in Egypt, some regimes are trying to convince either local uh, public opinion or international public opinion by saying, look, uh, we are trying to realize, to give people, uh, to realize and to guarantee their social and economic rights. But as I said, social and economic rights without uh, civil and political uh, rights have no meaning. Because the dignity of a human being, it's a total, it's, it's, it's total of rights. It's not only getting a job without being, uh, for example, respected as an equal human being to another, without being able to, part to participate in public affairs. And this, in Tunisia now, uh, the civil society should work massively on this uh, thesis to explain to young people, to the Tunisian, that look, it's, it's good to have uh, social and economical wealth, but also we have to look that our democratic transition is also uh, 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 an achievement and we have to protect it. 
Thank you, Amen. Thank you to Karim Fahim for that question. Um, the next question is for is for Lina, and you'll have to bring out your crystal ball, Lina, because this is asking you to look a little bit in the future. But the question is, um, do you think that a second revolutionary moment would be possible in Egypt in the medium term? And do you see potential in today's Egyptian youth to mobilize and catalyze a movement the way that their elder brothers and sisters did 10 years ago? I guess that makes you the elder brother and sister, Lina. Go ahead. The grandmother. I see uh, Romy rolling his eyes <laughs> at the question. Um, yeah, I mean, I I don't have a crystal ball, unfortunately, and I don't think anyone had ten years ago. Um, and I think um, I think we spend our time when we decide when we opt for being politically engaged to to be involved in politics in different ways, in whatever way possible. Again, within the margins, in a context that's uh, heavily authoritarian and that's like uh, authoritarianism 3.0, <laughs> post-revolutionary authoritarianism, which is a whole uh, different uh, um, a brand, I would say. Um, and then, you know, revolutions happen and they surprise us, you know, we, we, we don't make them uh, necessarily, uh, not necessarily those who are uh, on the forefront of the action or of the of, of politics. It's usually an amalgamation of different elements um, that, you know, are bound uh, to surprise us. So I guess I don't have an answer for this question in the sense that I would never know and I don't think anyone uh, would know. Um, but what I know is that a, everything is possible, and what I care about, uh, which is B, is that is is what I like to call, you know, using another um, theorist, um, the thick present. You know, what I what I care about is the now, the here and now. This is what um, what we can have a bit of control over. Um, so for me, right now, the here and now consists of you know trying hard as much as possible, but also holding space in case something big happens. Um, there needs to be spaces like Nada Mosul, like, um, you know, all these civil society groups that are there that, you know, basically um, close a bit or contribute to closing this institutional deficit that we have um, in, in, in organizing in, in the country. So we hold space. Um, uh, this is the most we are able to do at this, uh, at this point. And if something happens, um, I'll be very happy to be surprised again, you know. Great. Um, the next question is for Noura, but also maybe for, for you too, Lina, if you want to answer this. Um, what are some plans for groups like No Photo Zone and MetaMaster to expand their popularity and reach across different sects of Egyptian or Syrian societies and growing a national public debate under these oppressive rules? Noura, if you want to go first. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, actually, uh, as No Photo Zone, for sure, our like um, the large, our largest dream is to not see any uh, arbitrarily detainee or enforced disappeared across uh, not only the Arab world but all the world. But uh, yeah, we we are thinking and actually preparing to launch very soon a kind of initiative to have a kind of coalition for all uh, like uh, human rights activists uh, or families, especially wives of detainees and missing persons across the Arab world actually. And it will be, uh, more powerful to do so and i remember i was uh, in tunisia at uh, last summer and uh, we have a kind of um, uh, conference for human rights uh, defenders from the MENA region and what i saw uh, was very clear for me at this conference that the enforced disappearance is uh, in some way unifying the, the Arab world actually. It is something committed by all the, uh, uh, or almost all the uh, Sir, um, uh, Arab uh, authorities, uh, unfortunately. So this is a kind of um, initiative and I'm happy that I'm, uh, I'm saying this uh, through this platform. It's. It, it will be very powerful actually because we need to to do something like let's say on the level of international laws uh, on the level of uh, a kind of uh, UN resolution for example or uh, UN uh, um, uh, Security Council resolution something specifically for the enforced disappearance in the Arab world. 
Thanks. And, and Thanks. Lena, if you want to jump in, please do. Um, yeah, like Nua said, uh, we we have a we have a vested interest in 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 expanding um, the reach of our readership, and I'm very happy to see that what started off as um, people who share some affinities with you know the kind of uh, reporting we do, the kind of work we do, um, what started like that uh, sort of expanded um, into you know a greater uh, mass of audiences who simply you know are thirsty for professionally produced and 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 you know professionally pr produced news and information but also um but also independent um and, and of high quality and so on um and i feel that uh, this has been basically our main tool um of expansion that you know we are showing people that there's still a possibility for them to access um you know um well produce information at a time when you know there there aren't many outlets out there doing that and also after a period where Egyptians were exposed to the possibility of having independent narratives or at least alternative narratives to those uh, traditionally engineered by the state ever since the media landscape has been privatized um, in, in in the early 2000s uh, so the closure we are in right now is is, um, is so unconventional um, at least in as far as the last 10 years or 15 years uh, we're concerned for for Egyptians you know it's you know Egyptians the last 15 years were used to a very vibrant political TV they were used to you know different sorts of you know privately owned newspapers that would you know tell stories that are not conventionally um, told in the state media and all of this is shut now um, so in that sense I feel that this has been uh, our main tool of of, uh, of dissemination and in parallel to that we are in this job not just uh, because of the contentious part of it we are in this job because we're also a bunch of journalists who believe in the power of this profession this in the power of, of media um, in, in, you know, engaging uh, intelligent public debates in, in, you know, being sentient and, and acting like a company to people, especially in dire times. Um, and, you know, that reflects in, you know, the way we try to, you know, develop our storytelling mechanisms and the way we, we, you know, we tell our stories and so on. We're invested in the, in the, in the craft of the journalism itself as something that needs to constantly evolve, especially in the hyper-mediated world we live in. Absolutely. Thank you, Lina. This next question is directed at, at Amen, but it can really be answered by everyone as well. Um, but Amen, someone is asking, has activism changed in the last few years in regards to the digital scene? Um, she says, I remember the rumors about Tuni leaks in Tunisia. Is the internet still a powerful tool in the fight against government abuses? It's a good question. Uh, indeed, yes, uh, internet and uh, online platforms have played uh, a huge role in supporting the Tunisian civil society in the previous uh, year. And uh, social media are considered by many people as a powerful force for good, freedom, and uh, enabling a connection between people to organize themselves and to fight for human rights and the democratic transition. But uh, over uh, the previous years, uh, online platforms have come to be viewed also as a tool of hate speech, governmental harassment or bullying to human rights defenders, LGBTQI plus plus community and other vulnerable uh, groups. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, online platforms should go back a little bit uh, to, to step backward and to go to their essential role as a tool uh, of expression and the space to organize and to act safely. And uh, this should be made through the adoption of new policies by online platforms that protect freedoms of expression, but also other uh, human rights uh, and uh, individual freedoms and showing more transparency regarding their algorithm and content uh, moderation. And this is important. If we go back to uh, all the scandals uh, uh, related to Facebook and uh, other uh, online platforms, or in, uh, also in, not only in Tunisia, even in other countries in the region, 
uh, what's going on with the human rights defender, what, what's going on also with women using TikTok as an uh, uh, online platform to express themselves. I think, I think uh, online platforms uh, should assume their responsibility by changing, uh, uh, by changing and evolving uh, their policy to be more uh, 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 or to respond more to the current challenges of the civil society, not only in Tunisia, but in the whole region. Thanks, Eamon. And, and, and Lina, I've got to say, the Egyptian government has really caught on to these digital spaces and cracking down on them. Um, is there still space in Egypt for that kind of activism online? I think whether we like it or not, um, you know, online spaces remain quite open for people to try out different kinds of things. You know, um, you know, while the crackdown has continued on these spaces in different forms and ways, um, you know, and for different kinds of expression, and we share what uh, Ayman referred to, which is the prosecution of young women producing content um, on on TikTok, entertainment content, basically. Um, so, so, so these women have been prosecuted on the basis of um, of of of, um, um, of defaming morality and uh, and the, the, the you know the values of the Egyptian family whatever that means so we have uh, we are in this situation too but that doesn't preclude the fact that these online spaces also remain quite open for you know different kinds of eruptions you know and for example Egypt has not been a um, a an exception to you know online expressions around uh, the me too movement for example um in fact online spaces have been quite prominent uh, in this uh, in this um, you know mobilization um against uh, acts of sexual uh, violence uh, basically um basically uh, uh, naming aggressors uh, and and bringing out testimonials online in both organized and also spontaneous ways so so it's it's still there um, there are still ways to occupy these spaces um, despite the difficulty but we cannot say that um, that it doesn't exist anymore and, and Noura, I think, you know, from, from our perspective as Amnesty International, we do so much work campaigning on, on Syria and especially the Israeli situation, forced disappearances. But we find that, you know, the world tires and people tire of hearing the same stories again and again. We've had, you know, the, the war has raged for so many years. Sometimes that online space can be useful for generating, especially individual cases. Um, is that something that you have found in, in, in your work, especially with, with detainees? Yeah, exactly. And uh, because of social media and the internet, for example, we could reach the Free Basel campaign to every single country in the world. And we have like a lot of like thousands of volunteers in this campaign. It's the same um, uh, in like in, like the, the Families Association in Syria, Families for Freedom, for example, and also No Photos On. We use the social media a lot because it's a kind of a platform and it's a space to to know what is happening in the world and it's also a, a place to to say what uh, what um, what is happening with uh, with you so it's very important but i totally agree with lena and Eamon. it can be used in in so bad way uh, actually and uh, i think also for like uh the the government and the authorities in the arab world it's a kind of uh renewal by by issuing a kind of uh, laws uh, to criticize the like or uh, naming the electronic uh, or online crimes um so it's um like it's a kind of safe space to express or to to tell uh, but also it's it has um its own risk also because almost everything is watched by the uh, security and intelligence um so it has like these different uh, two ways of uh, of usage. Thanks. Another question um, for for all three of you. Um, holding space is a great achievement, and by which I think this is a question from Nancy Arkel, and I think what she's referring to uh, is is when Lena was talking about holding that space open for 
future um, for future movements and, and, and movements for change. So holding that space is a great achievement, she says. It's almost impossible for all three countries under these conditions. Do you think within those challenges, uh, we are able to cross from the space of resistance to that of offering alternative realities and solutions? Uh, maybe we start with you, Amen, if you feel comfortable. It's it's very complicated question and uh, uh, I mean and it's very important also how to uh, uh, to change from protest and contestation movement to more positive and to build something and uh, as I, I answered to the first question maybe one of the of the reason of uh, uh, why the political party of Abir Musi is in the bottom of uh, the ranking now of the political party in Tunisia because the revolutionary parties and the civil society and the human rights defender who they took part in the revolution in 2011 uh, we couldn't uh, change our position from uh, a force of a contest of protest to a force of suggestion and uh, I cannot uh, put all the responsibility uh, to the civil society or to the militant of human rights and uh, political opposition. Uh, it has uh, other very deep and complicated um, reasons. First of all, as I have mentioned, we could uh, succeed to kick out uh, Ben Ali, the dictator from the country, but the regime is still here. And uh, it's also, uh, uh, it has its own tools of resistance and you, we can find in the media landscape, we find in uh, banking, in big uh, company in Tunisia and those are conservative forces and they refuse changes and uh, uh, I think uh, democracy or transition to democracy needs time. In 10 years it's for me a very short period to judge, uh, maybe we need uh, uh, 10 or 20 years more uh, to be able to realize uh, uh, the, the goals of, of the revolution and to be able to find also other tools uh, uh, to counter uh, the old regime uh, uh, instruments. And I think step by step, as, as long as we're still able to express ourselves, to go to the street and uh, to push the government and the parliament to step backward, at any time where they want to uh, adopt laws which want to go back uh, uh, which want to go back and to withdraw freedoms or, 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 or other rights this is very important we can build on it uh, we are fighting at the moment for example in Tunisia to implement constitutional court and other constitutional bodies such as the regulatory body of uh, media or the, uh, the, the authority of, uh, uh, of tackling corruptions and other uh, constitutional body and those uh, those institutions are very important to strengthen the institutional guarantees and to impede politicians from interfering in media outlets or from adopting laws which infringe uh, our freedom such as freedom of assembly association or, uh, or, or expression and uh, we are fighting at the moment to implement the constitutional court and other uh, uh, other as i said other, other institution and uh, I think the fight is ongoing. And uh, at the end, of, at the end, you know, a human, the human being born as free. So at the end, sure, uh, we will reach our aim and uh, we will realize uh, uh, we will succeed uh, to build a democratic society in Tunisia. Nina, same question about crossing from the space of resistance to that of offering alternative realities and solutions. Your thoughts? Uh, I, thought I want to, add to, to thank Nancy for the question. Um, I happen to be in this uh, privileged position of uh, engaging with ideas of change uh, from a discursive pers perspective being in media. So that's always the easier <laughs> to think and to write, and, and, but that's also much needed, especially um, in spaces where we are constantly negated this, this, uh, this possibility of thinking together and producing thought together. But what I wanted to say is that uh, I don't, I, I think the moment we think that there needs to be a complete idea of an alternative 
um, complete in terms of how we imagine it and how we want to implement it becomes a moment of impossibility in and of itself. I feel that being the site of resistance ha bears the responsibility of being actively a site of other possibilities, other alternatives. And this is at least what we try to do without being too abstract again um, in, in the journalism we do. So for example, we're not just invested in you know, covering violations, documenting the reality, the gloom we live in and all of that. We're constantly also invested in um, engaging questions of possibilities. Like to give you an example, in the last uh, few months, we've started this, this, um, we've started this content series that basically tries to reimagine how do we want Tahrir Square to look like. So basically we've commissioned a number of urban planners and architects um, and, and, you know, and, and theorists of urban regenerations and so on. Um, we've, we've given each one of them a building in Tahrir Square and we've said, you know, if you are asked to, to, you know, to put together a plan for reuse, for reimagining how this space can be used, how would you do it? And we've started collecting some fantastic pro proposals that, you know, putting them out there, publishing them out there, becomes in and of itself the beginning of imagining that alternative somehow. So I feel that this is a responsibility uh, somehow is, is, you know, resistance is constantly coupled with not just looking at those who are bothering us, but also being able to look at that which we're, we're, we're fighting for, that which we want uh, to look forward to. A great example. Thank you. Um, Noura, do you have any thoughts on this? Actually, I don't have this much to add uh, on what uh, Lina has said, uh, but yeah, it's our res responsibility as as activists uh, to like also to not only resist, but also we like people need solution for their own problems. Like for example, when we are talking about uh, the complication of the issue of infant disappearance in Syria, it's not enough just to say this uh, to mention this because like even the international opinion or the international community will get bored of like um mentioning this for for nothing uh, like the even the personal and sad story and also happy story it affects us just one twice three ten times but not forever so we need to find solution for all for 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 those people for the suffering of, of them with keeping in mind this complication and um, uh, conf confusion of this file because it's like the like the worst file of violation against the human rights in Syria and it's so related uh, uh, with the like uh, transitional uh, political transition in in Syria so we need to find a kind of short term or a, a mid term justice at least for for those families at least to know how to deal with our like daily pain and uh, open wounds all all the time I agree. I mean, it's it's all about hope, isn't it? I mean, I think uh, I really identify from a human rights organization perspective. We're always being told that we're, you know, asking people to, for their support, but we're not offering them a vision of the solution. So it's hard for them to get to keep being motivated to help. So yeah, there's that fine line between, um, I guess, boxing ourselves into a reality that can never be, um, but also offering some sort of hope. So yeah, I, I certainly um, identify. Rami, you thought you were off the hook, but there is a question for you, so get yourself ready. Um, there's a question here. Um, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, Rami, regarding the possibilities of an emerging political alternative in Egypt, given the unprecedented consolidation of authoritarian power and the erosion of the generation that developed firsthand political experience pre and post 2011 due to detention and forced exile. I'd also appreciate your thoughts on whether and or how Egyptian diaspora can contribute uh, to forms of political change. And maybe I'll, I'll um, ask all of you that question about people in the diaspora and how they can help um, back home. But Rami, for now, to you. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, I guess uh, I can't really answer that without going back to my personal experiences with trying to organize. And I think Nancy's question prior to this one kind of ties into it as well. I think Nancy and I, uh, when she was executive director of Tahrir, um, we used to struggle and think about that a lot together. 
Um, and I will say it is, it is almost, uh, I, I'm not being pessimistic, but it's almost impossible. One of it for new alternatives to come up. And let me explain very briefly why. And also draw on some of the unfortunate experiences that I personally learned from. One of the amazing things that happened during the uprisings, at least in Egypt, in, in my humble experience, is that we were able to create somewhat of a political vacuum on top for like political parties to emerge or political movements to happen, right? But unfortunately, um, uh, and, and some people can say this is fortunate, but in my view, uh, it's unfortunate that these uh, protesting movements in Egypt, at least, did not really materialize into political organizations or actually feed into it. There's a lot of a lot of infighting. There's a lot of also because there is so much repression. There were a lot of uh, people who are not prepared for this kind of kind of political organizing and and seeing the value of it. I think also there is a high of the moment where we were all. All of us were guilty of that, including myself. We were all very stringent with the Puritan approach to what we wanted to create, or my views versus this person's views uh, on, I don't know, uh, subsidies or, or social welfare, which was very intricate. On opposed to now, looking back in hindsight, we're we're thinking like maybe I could have compromised on this like minor thing, on opposed to being completely crushed, right? So uh, it, hindsight again is twenty twenty. So I would say, um, uh, in addition to that also, that governments in the Middle East, and I'll take Egypt as an example, have a very proactive way of trying to destroy and dismantle uh, any political organizations uh, in their infancy stages. There's lots of always, you know, stories about political, um, you know, um, Kind of domestic espionage on, on on political parties or sending in uh, individuals to like rise through the ranks to do create sabotage or be informants or this and that. So that make in itself makes it very inherently hard, even if people had the will and the way. Add to that in people in organizations in Egypt and the current like repression, where like when people had had a meeting for this movement, the hope movement, prior to the parliamentary elections, you know, people just getting arrested simply for having the notion and idea of trying to contemplate a political run in a parliament that we know we're is, is already going to be swayed heavily towards the regime and it's going to you know, so it, it's very hard. And but that. I, I, with all that said, I don't want to sound extremely pessimistic, and I want to look at where the seeds of hope are. And I think this is where like the diaspora community works, or or keepers of the truth like Lena and others on the ground trying to maintain that small space, where our job now is to keep the truth, correct the narrative, maintain the knowledge, and try to pass it on to uh, new generations to wait for also this kind of maybe perhaps this crack or open that might happen. It doesn't have to be a spark of a revolution or a huge protest, but rather just a space for some creation of a political um, political opening, if you will. Uh, and I think that's also the role of the diaspora. I've spoken too much, but I'll, I'll just leave space for uh, the rest of the panelists to give their thoughts as well. That's great. Thank you, Romy. Um, Amen. what is the role of either Tunisians in exile or the diaspora who have left? Um, what's their role right now? What can they do? Uh, well, uh, we don't have really, uh, I mean, the problem for the, in the Tunisian context is not the same like, for example, in Egypt or in Libya or Syria. Uh, but I would also, uh, I don't have much things to add uh, on what Romy said, uh, but also working on uh, international institution and international organization uh, to convince them uh, to put human rights on the table uh, while they are negotiating with uh, such regime, for example, with the World Bank. Uh, and this, uh, I have been involved in working with <clears throat> some uh, uh, NGO uh, to convince the World Bank uh, uh, to put human rights on the table uh, while he's giving credit, for example, to Egypt or to Tunisia or to any other. Uh, country in the region. This is important uh, to raise awareness there in in Europe or in United States uh, uh, about what's going on here, and to be our uh, our our voice. Our because in some in some uh, in some region in some area in our region we have really missing voices, and they could, they cannot express themselves. So people in diaspora they could do uh, they could do this role. 
and uh, <clears throat> I want to go back a little bit uh, uh, to one of the main challenges of uh, organizing uh, in, in Tunisia, but also it could be uh, the same situation in, uh, in Egypt or in any other country, uh, particularly after the pandemic. Uh, we found out that a lot of small association and uh, small, uh, small association, they couldn't get fund, either local fund or international fund. And this also uh, contributed to, uh, to, 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 to make their voices uh, missing more. So we have to think a little bit how to find alternate to help those small associations, not, not only in Tunisia, but uh, everywhere. Uh, this is important. Also uh, in Egypt, uh, in Algeria, but also in Tunisia, we saw that uh, either draft laws or new laws uh, were adopted by the, the regime. And the aim is to cut uh, funding uh, uh, to the local association. For example, in last April, in Algeria, uh, they voted new law to amend the penal code. And uh, among the provisions adopted by the parliament is that uh, the foreign, fu foreign uh, funding could be, uh, uh, could be a crime and you could be uh, sanctioned for four years of prison if you are getting. And that's why, for example, a journalist, and uh, also I want to share my solidarity with him, Khal Drani in Egypt, in, uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, in Algeria now in, in, is in prison and uh, among the charges is uh, getting uh, foreign fund. Thank you. Thanks, and, and Noura, you are a living example of what um, you know people can do when they leave the country and, and in terms of helping and mobilizing. But I wanna ask you specifically also about you know, it, it's it's very easy for us to all sit here and say, you know, this is something that you can do in theory and mobilize and activate and so on. But there's also concerns about family who are still living in the country. So how do you balance that? Okay, so I'm I've been thinking about this for for years. Actually, it's not because of my own family, because most of my family are activists anyway, but uh, it's because of the families of the people, particularly women that I I support with my NGO in in Lebanon and in Turkey. So the best scenario that we found is that to like to focus on this humanitarian part. A part of each uh, story. It's not. Um, sometimes uh, we we feel that it's so boring to talk about politics all the time because, mm, like, the basis of the po of politics in in every place is the like this respect of dignity of uh, of any human being. So when we focus on on dignity and on the like this personal and emotional suffering, we find that it's a kind of uh, first step to like unify Syrians um, like inside and outside Syria so um, and this is what we are doing in no photo zone actually we we provide our services for any any anyone that have detainees or uh, detainee or missing person in Syria regardless of their political backgrounds and for sure we all are against any kind of tyranny or, or injustice but we feel that this kind of suffering unifies Syrians so we 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 could be success to together uh, like loyalist and um, and opposition and uh, this is what um, like make our position stronger actually to have the solidarity from from almost everyone and this is what i could achieve with the free basel campaign actually because i was talking about specific like parties and specific issues that uh, like i think i i don't know but i think that no one could be uh disagree that this is uh, against the human rights Thanks, Noura. We um, amazingly have, have sped past the hour and a half and we only have a few minutes left. So I just want to ask a final question to all of you um, and feel free to also integrate any of your final thoughts in this. Um, so you have about maybe a minute or so each to answer. Um, but, you know, there has been this question that's come up again and again, sort of a theme in, in, in a lot of the questions have been asked. And I asked it as well of, of Noura in, in my final question to her, this idea that, you know, the, the governments um, are painting this narrative 
narrative of um, terrorists and traitors and how do you do your your work and how do you fight against this sort of narrative um, and there's real legislation out there too that paint you know there's a reason why they're painting you in this way you know it, it is to it is to have an excuse to to shut you down and worse um, so you know what is your advice to those people who are out there listening and who are you know looking for some sort of you know way forward or advice how you work um, around these sort in these sorts of environments um, do you want to go first um, I don't know maybe Rami go first and we'll, and we'll go around that way uh, okay all right very quickly I'd say one thing uh, on that uh, is that um, and this is kind of kind of directed towards actually the governments of the Middle East. Once you start calling activist terrorists, uh, it might be beneficial on the short run, but it will backfire, I assure you, definitively. Without a doubt, it's going to happen. It's going to backfire. It might be, and, and this is actually where, um, you know, false narratives lose. Uh, no matter how long you think it's going to be uh, a benefit for you to call activists like Noura terrorists or like anyone else, uh, you're, you're, on the, you're on the losing side now. Uh, so what do pe people do? I think um, educate yourself, keep informed, listen to these voices like Nora, like what Lena's organization is doing, um, like I, what Ayman's doing. Uh, and, and we we will figure out from there. And I'll just pass it on uh, to whoever's next. Thanks, Nami. Good advice. Nora, your advice. Actually, my advice um, is for the regimes themselves. Um, it's a kind of like a really a very warm advice for them to just rethink again of their attitude and position during all these years and maybe if they change uh, their their attitude towards their people maybe everyone will be a winner good advice for them too amen i'm i don't know if i'm I have the legitimacy to, to give advices. I just want to say that uh, we, are, we are defending a very noble uh, cause. And uh, we are fighting for, for ourselves, for our family, and for our society. Democracy, human rights is a noble thing. If, we are, if someone is really believing in, in this cause, you have not to care too much to what's the regime or other political parties or any other groups are uh, describing us we have to keep uh, going for the good of our nation for the good of our humanity beautifully said thank you amen lena your final thoughts uh two quick things um uh, i i i feel that uh, governments are reading notions of terrorism of their meaning in the way They've been using them in legal systems, in um, in security settings, and so on. Um, so the more it's being used in this way, the more it's losing meaning. Um, and you know, with that comes a major crisis of legitimacy that I don't know how it would, will be dealt with. So that's one part. And then the other part is that, as far as I'm concerned, um, I it's a very classical answer. I invest in my work um as my main site of legitimacy the the credibility of the work we do um speaks for who we are and what we do so i don't feel like we need to spend too much time um you know counter narrating what uh, what they call us and so on we just let the work uh do it for on our behalf Nina, Amen, Noura, really, you, you are inspirational. It has been more than an honor to be with you this last hour and a half. I'm very, very humbled. Um, thank you to all of you. Thank you for those um, 100 people who have been watching and listening for the last hour and a half. And with that, I will hand to my friend May. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you, Rami. Th and thank you, Shireen, for being such a remarkable moderator and to our speakers. 
Ayman Zaghdoudi, Lina Atallah, and Noura Ghazi for such a dynamic and reflective, but also very forward-looking conversation. You left us with a lot to think about, and I think a lot of what you said today will, will carry on. Um, to our audience, this, is the event, this event is the first in a series that will address a number of other themes and new countries, including Yemen and Libya. Uh, don't think we forgot about you, as well as other countries across the region as well. To our audience again, I'd like to thank you for your participation and engagement. We look forward to continuing to learn from you, to collaborate with you, and to host you as well. And, and thanks to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.